Dear colleagues from across the world, thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to another of the IPC South Asia and IPC of UNICEF South Asia and IPC webinar. My name is Pedro Ruda. I'm a researcher at the IPC and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, as most of you probably know, today's webinar is the fifth of a series of a webinar series that has started back in May. Um, um, but uh, I'd like to start inviting you to join our next webinar to take place on October the 22nd. So as I was saying, as most of you probably know, today's webinar is the fifth of a webinar series that has started back in May. Since then, every month we have been hosting one webinar dedicated to discuss core takeaways based on ongoing agendas we have in partnership with UNICEF Regional Office for South Asia, as well as with the UNICEF country offices at each of the eight countries in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So in this current slide, you can see a list of the six core papers we have produced as part of this collaboration. Five of them discuss social protection features of South Asia before the COVID crisis. More specifically, they look at social expenditure profiles in the region, overall design features of flagship programs, and how child and gender sensitive they are, the prevailing legal framework for child protection and social protection in the region, and the core findings of impact evaluations of existing programs. In addition, there is a sixth paper listed in this slide that discusses the COVID responsive measures adopted in the region. Now, if you go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, yes, thank you. So our research, goes far beyond those six papers we listed in the, in the previous slide. And you know, there are one pagers, there are papers, a lot of additional papers related to that agenda. And if you want to explore the full content that has already been published or that is still forthcoming, please make sure you check an organized list of those deliverables, which we have prepared through dedicated blog spots. There is one blog spot only to the pre-COVID analysis of South Asia, and another one to the COVID-specific analysis for South Asia. Um, in the if you move to the following slide, please. Um, before moving to introduce our speakers of today and talking about the overall format of this webinar, let me just invite you to the global e-conference on how to turn the COVID-19 into an opportunity. This is jointly organized by the IPC and other partners. And it will be a huge event to take place over three days on an almost non-stop format, with events taking place at pretty much all time zones. There will be dozens, maybe hundreds of presentations from a varied set of development players. Our colleagues at the IPC and partner institutions have been working super hard to put this together and it would be a great pleasure to have all of you on board. Uh, please check the link in this slide, and there you can see further information and the several different panels and virtual booths and kind of, event, uh, in kind of, of uh, events that will be part of this conference. Now, in the next slide, and getting back to today's webinar, um, just like in the webinar we delivered in August, we will break down the comparative studies we made for the South Asian region into country-specific analysis. Today's webinar will start by a presentation by IPC's Yannick on Pakistan, and that will be followed by a presentation by IPC's Fabiana on India, and both of them will follow the same structure for discussing their country which consists of presenting the main legal framework of their countries, then discussing the social expenditure profile of those countries, and then subsequently moving to a more 
program-oriented description of flagship initiatives. Their, their overall design and more specifically, the child and gender sensitive features of those programs. Finally, they will each move into discussing how social protection systems of these countries have adapted to the COVID crisis. After that, we will have a very interesting and important presentation by colleagues from UNICEF India, Antara and Sumer. They will share with us their ground experience as influent players on the very design of responses to the COVID. More specifically, they will take it from where Fabiana left and shed some light on what should come next for social protection in India. And if I may give a spoiler here, stay tuned until the end as their presentation will include interesting discussions on the potential rolling out of a universal child grant for India. Another important point I need to make has to do with how we will proceed with questions. You should all have both a chat and a key question and answer box at the bottom of your, of your screen. The chat box will serve for our facilitators to share with you links and other information during the presentation. But if you want to convey any question, and we strongly encourage you to do convey questions, please make sure you click on the question and answer box. We will be taking note of all the questions during the presentation, and in the last 30 minutes of the webinar, we will have the opportunity for presenters to address them. Please do send your questions as they come to, to your mind. There is no need to wait until the end of all presentations for sending your questions. Questions and answers are the most interesting part of this webinar, so please don't be shy to send your questions. Now, in the next slide, yes, so in, in the next slide, we have a quick view of our presenter. So starting our webinar today, we're going to have Yannick who is a social protection specialist at the IPC with focus on design, implementation, and impact evaluation of programs. Uh, he is a focal point for agendas with Pakistan, also collaborates on agendas with Afghanistan, and he holds a master's in economic for development from the University of Oxford and a bachelor in international economics from the University of Tübinger. Uh, in the next slide, we have a quick view of Fabiana. Fabiana Bastille is also a researcher at the IPC with a, a social protection specialist with a focus on universal grants and, and she's a focal point for agendas with India. She holds a master's in development studies from Cambridge and a bachelor's in economics from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and another bachelor's in international affairs from the Federal Fluminense University. Uh, our third presentation in the, following, in the next slide will be jointly delivered by Suman and Antara. Suman Bakshi is a social policy specialist leading the public financial management and local governance issues in the country office of South of UNICEF in India. He has over 22 years of experience of working in areas of local governance and public finance. He previous his previous work experiences include working at the FID. He's an economist with PhD on decentralized local governance, urban basic services, and impact on urban poor. And finally, Antara Lahiri has 14 years of experience in social policy, working with organizations like UNICEF, India, UNICEF Indonesia, World Bank, Washington DC, and Ashoka Innovators for Public Policy. Currently, she is the Social Policy Specialist for UNICEF India and provides technical support to the government on social policy with special emphasis on social protection. She's a lawyer and a Fulbright Scholar with a Master's in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. So, well, my name is Pedro Ruda. I'm a researcher at the IPC and I'm very honored for being today's facilitator of, today, of, of this webinar. Please make sure you do send your questions at any time through the questions and answers box. 
And without further delay, let's hand it over to Fabiana for the first presentation. Over to you, Fabi. Um, actually, the first one to present is Yannick with Pakistan. Yes, sorry. So over to you, Yannick. Absolutely. Thank you a lot, Pedro. My screen here. Perfect. Then, uh, yeah, thank you a lot, Pedro, for the kind introduction. Um, and hello, everybody. I am a researcher at the IPCIG, and I have the pleasure of presenting today a brief snapshot into the social. Jumping right into the legal framework, Pakistan was actually the first country in the region to became, uh, become a signatory of any of the core human rights instruments on social protection in 1966. Um, to date, Pakistan has these nine core human rights based instru instruments, and you can see the two remaining ones highlighted. The committee a regular review of the legislative frameworks um, of member states, Pakistan's. In its latest review in 2016, the, uh, um, there are a couple of pending bills to be adopted by Pakistan. And importantly, that there is a need to harmonize legislation on the federal, but also on subnational levels with the CRC. And the pertinence of this recommendation better, we need to look into the constitution of Pakistan. Here, social protection is enshrined as a policy principle, which is distinct from a legally enforceable right. Importantly, also, um, an amendment from 2010 delegates substantial authority over financial, legal, and administrative aspects of social protection to the subnational level. So in Pakistan, it provinces play quite an integral part of social protection. Um, um, exactly. Um, <laughs> we have Pakistan, a situation where some provincial that are mostly concerned with aspects of governance and framework, though, but uh, they are rather silent on enshrining rights or dictate. Hence, it is not surprising to the cross cutting of national really enshrine these rights or principles associated with social. For the program level, ideally, programs would have their own regulatory frameworks for two programs out of a sample of four flagship programs in Pakistan that we analyze. The Benazir Income Support Program, BISP, and the Pakistan Bait ul -Mal. We're gonna come to these regulatory frameworks and their importance because they establish a legal underpinning of, their, of the operation of these programs in a second. Before, I want to briefly comment on the ESAS initiative though. The ASAS strategy is a multi-sectoral umbrella initiative launched by the Pakistani government in spring last year. Um, and it aims to establish a strategic vision for poverty alleviation, uh, increase alignment in the social protection sector, and make important program amendments to the social protection landscape. However, the ASAS strategy is not legislation, but rather a policy guide does not act as a legal framework for any of the programs under its umbrella. For the two regulatory frameworks that do exist, it's important and informative to have a look um, at their compliance features of a human rights-based approach to social protection. Previously, we noted that provincial social protection legislation is often concerned administrative issues, but rather silent on specific program design features. It's to carry over even into regulatory frameworks where some issues in coordination or financial agreements are rather well um, regulated, whereas others are insufficiently or not at all covered. 
some of these issues include foremost specific design features for the implementation of programs, such as precise eligibility requirements, predictability of benefits, complaints and appeals mechanisms, and participatory channels. Let's next have a look at social expenditure in Pakistan. The 4.1% of GDP that Pakistan allocates to social issues ranks among the second lowest in the region. Education is the not spent less than uh, the regional average. Outcomes, however, are still unsatisfying here. For out of school children of primary and lower secondary Asia live in Pakistan. On the other hand, Pakistan is the country that spends most per student on tertiary education. In the realms of health expenditure, uh, two thirds of the health expenditure Pakistan uh, is borne by households throughout of and it's estimated that that is also the reason behind more than one in ten of uh, more, more than one in who were pushed into extreme poverty. These high levels of um, also come with rather poor performance related indicators. The examples are, for, uh, for example, underweight prevalence, mortality rates, immunization rates, or skilled birth attendance. So here it's really important to have a shift away, um, shift away the burden and provide adequate care, particularly for children and mothers. Sense, it's encouraging to see that the recent budget of COVID-19 crisis makes, uh, provides for more than a doubling of the health budget in Pakistan. Um, expenditure on non-contributory social protection, Pakistan spends less than 1% of its GDP on this sector, most of which accrues to the Benazir Income Support Program unconditional cash transfer. Here, it's important that I provide the qualifier that the Aspire data set where our information is from perhaps inadequately covers spending on the subnational level. Um, which does pr uh, play a pivotal role, of course, in, in Pakistan. So while the need for um, enhanced social spending in Pakistan is clear, Pakistan also presents a particularly challenging case, challenging economic environment for fiscal spending. A possible solution would be to improve tax to GDP ratios. Like these, this low ratio in Pakistan does not seem them of low tax rates, which tend to be among the high, but rather an issue of tax effort and compliance. Let Jenny? us finally come to the program level. And here I will. Jenny, sorry. Sorry yes. to interrupt you here. Uh, our colleagues from Social Protection seem to have identified a, a broadband issue. So maybe if you turn off your camera, you would get a better audio. Would you mind? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Okay. My audio should be off, but you should be seeing my screen again. Is that the case, Pedro? Yes, your video is off, but your audio seems okay. It seems better now as well. Okay, perfect. Apologies for that. Um, so yeah, uh, let's turn to, to the program level. Um, and here I will uh, first focus on our original sample program. And I will mention how important gaps of this um, of, of these existing programs are now through a number of new initiatives in green that were launched by the ASAS initiative after the time frame or outside the time frame for our mapping study though. In general, um, Pakistan features a mix of integrated multi-component programs such as uh, the Baitumal and more specialized programs. The most prominent, uh, most prominent program in Pakistan is the Benazir Income Support 
which is an unconditional cash transfer, or rather a, a successor program, Scafalat transfer. The SR Scafalat transfer provides for a coverage to, of up to 7 million households, which would amount to percent of the population. For targeting measures, Pakistan regularly relies on proxy means tests based on the poverty and income scorecard survey that is currently seeing a comprehensive update in order to provide for better targeting. Given rising to see a strong emphasis on targeting the poor in, uh, in Pakistan, but oftentimes programs also make special provisions for children. I've already spoiled that currently there is a considerable expansion of social protection or social assistance underway through the SRS initiative, addressing important pre-existing gaps. Such gaps addressed are an enhanced focus on women, for example, through productive and financial inclusion or education. Secondly, um, programs catering to the working age group, particularly daily laborers. And thirdly, also, we already discussed the issue of poor health outcome indicators, especially for young mothers and children in Pakistan. An important gap we see here compared to other countries in South Asia is thus a flagship program catering to newborns and pregnant and lactating women through nutrition and health related interventions. And a conditional cash transfer just like that is currently being piloted in Pakistan. With all the gaps that uh, might be addressed in the future, a currently unutilized option to double down on really reducing the opportunity costs of sending children to primary and lower secondary school would be a flagship school feeding initiative. One of the key features of our analysis in the IPCIG studies was an on the child and gender sensitivity of social protection systems. In the child domain in Pakistan, mostly uh, we see mostly conditional cash transfers to facilitate education access and one geographically limited program focusing on improving health outcomes for children. Furthermore, there is an evident lack of programs addressing nutrition shortcomings, particularly a flagship school feeding program. Um, and also there is kind of a lack of a program targeting young children and pregnant and lactating women. Gender sensitive considerations uh, in Pakistan saw their inception already with the old programs. For example, the Benazir income support program that pays um, its benefits to female household heads. But these gender considerations really gain particular prominence now in the currently ongoing expansion, which you can see in the light blue rows of the table. In this regard, I want to at least briefly mention a promising pilot program, um, a nutrition and health conditional cash transfer that is being piloted right now in the nine districts with the highest stunting uh, rates in, in, uh, in Pakistan. This would fill a very important former gap in the life cycle by promoting safe delivery practices and um, nutrition and health-based interventions for pregnant and lactating women and children up to two years of age. In order to improve any social protection system, it is vital to have a rigorous evidence basis. That is about why in another study, we look at the results of quantitative impact evaluations of programs in Pakistan. The only, prob uh, the only program we see comprehensively evaluated is the Benazir Income Support Program in Pakistan. However, this at least is a very good example of a comprehensive and stringent set of studies evaluating the program. This set of studies uh, find uh, desirable impacts on poverty reduction, on asset accumulation, and on income, and also quite a few desirable impacts of the unconditional cash transfer in the gender domain. However, uh, effects on the education domain are rather subdued. The SR strategy launched last year calls, um, also importantly calls for more quantitative quasi-experimental or experimental evaluations of initiatives, which would be a really desirable future development if conducted in a similar fashion to the one we're seeing here of the BISP. 
Particularly, it would be interesting to see more programs in Pakistan evaluated according to their effect in the health domain. The last pair of studies I want to summarize focused on the social protection response to the COVID-19 crisis in Pakistan. Here, two measures stuck out in Pakistan. The first one was a cash transfer called SR's Emergency Cash, which provided a transfer of about a third of monthly household income to 16.9 million households, so almost 50% of the population. The focus of SR's Emergency Cash was twofold. Firstly, it focused on a group pertaining to the poorest in the population that were existing beneficiaries of the SR's Kafalat cash transfer. Secondly, it horizontally expanded social protection to beneficiaries previously not covered by social assistance. Um, and these were mainly informal workers and daily laborers. Through that, SAS Emergency Cash is an excellent example of using social registry data and on-demand enrollment for a shock responsive expansion of the social protection system, which also would build future resilience. If you're interested to uh, learn a little bit more about SAS Emergency Cash and the adequacy of it, I can recommend to you a forthcoming working paper by the IPCIG, which deals with these issues in depth. The second measure that stuck out in Pakistan was the so-called Rosga scheme, which was um, a credit scheme to firms to cover for their payroll costs for three to six months in exchange for the firms committing to no layoffs. Through that, the scheme secured incomes and workplaces of over 1.1 million workers in Pakistan. In addition to that, there were a couple of smaller initiatives um, launched in Pakistan, such as food distribution and ration distribu uh, distribution, food and utility subsidies, public works, and a number of smaller province-led initiatives. I want to end my presentation today with five succinct policy recommendations that emerged out of our analyses. The first one um, is related to a big challenge for coordination in Pakistan. First of all, the ISAS initiative pushes for a streamlined and not fragmented social protection system. But at the same time, of course, in Pakistan, um, the constitutional responsibility chiefly lies with provinces. So this builds a very important necessity to build consensus among national and subnational stakeholders and enshrine this consensus in legislation that is compliant with a human rights-based approach to social protection. My second takeaway relates to the challenging economic situation in Pakistan and the uncertainty surrounding the crisis. Here, it will be integral to keep expanding social spending and shelter this, this uh, expenditure from budget cuts in order not to jeopardize the positive trajectory embarked on. Thirdly, to further improve the child and gender sensitivity of the social protection system and address current challenges in Pakistan, two key programs would be a flagship national school feeling program and a scaled up version of the nutrition conditional cash transfer uh, to pregnant and lactating women that is currently being piloted. Fourthly, COVID-19 can be something like a black swan event for Pakistan or for social protection in Pakistan. What do I mean by, by that? What I mean is that if the lessons learned find their way in from the crisis, find their way into regular social protection system, this could trigger a number of very interesting and important developments in Pakistan. For example, it could comprise an expansion of social protection to the missing middle. It would comprise a comprehensive updating of the social registry and improvement of, uh, manage, uh, of um, um, management and evaluation mechanisms. Um, it would comprise uh, digital uh, digitalization of social protection and financial inclusion. And ultimately, all these things would mean future resilience building for the social protection system in Pakistan. 
Lastly, um, I watched a talk show the other day um, and heard Sanya Nishta, who is the Prime Minister's so uh, Special Assistant on Social Safety in Pakistan. I heard her speak in this talk show and, she's, uh, and she spoke of an unprecedented spirit of collaboration and something like a can-do attitude that facilitated a whole-of-government approach during the crisis. And it's vital to carry this attitude over to post-crisis social protection and foster collaboration between stakeholders, including, of course, subnational governments, given their constitutional role in delivering social protection. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I stay put, of course, to um, answer any questions. Thank you very much. And back to you, Pedro. Thank you, Yannick, for a very interesting presentation. It's really interesting to see how you know, a lot of new initiatives in Pakistan are blossoming at the very moment the COVID crisis has hit the country. So it's, it's, let's see how this evolves and how much does this, this timing will, will make these initiatives to have shock responses, shock responsiveness pretty much hardwired on their DNA. Uh, I would like now to invite our colleague Fabiana to present to deliver her presentation on India. Hi, Fabiana. Hi. Um. Thank you for the introduction and thank you, Yannick, for the presentation. Um. So I'm going to talk, as Pedro has explained, I'm going to talk about the same studies as Yannick, but I'm going to focus on India instead of uh, Pakistan. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, so, as the table is showing, um, India is either a state party or a signatory of eight out of the nine most relevant human rights instruments that promote social protection and children's rights, with uh, the one exception being the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of their Families. Um, but to guarantee the applicability of these instruments, they have to be translated into domestic law, otherwise they might not be fully implemented, as is the case of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, India is a state party of the CRC and the country has actually enacted child-focused statutory legislation, but this legislation does not fully implement the CRC and this was exactly one of the comments made in the last concluding observations of the CRC committee, which also expressed some, some worries on the fragmentations and inconsistencies in child's right implementation. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, looking more carefully into the Constitution, it contemplates social protection only as a policy principle, not as an enforceable right. As to the development of social protection interventions, India, which is defined as a union of states in the Constitution, places social security and social insurance within the concurrent list, meaning that both central and state governments can design and implement social protection programs. However, as an overarching framework is lacking, the range and nature of policies and programs can vary greatly, just as the role of single states in designing, financing, and implementing them. So as a result, what we observe is that India has a very high number of diverse social protection schemes at central, state, and local levels. Um, the analysis made in our studies are based on seven national flagship programs. Uh, as I said, these subnational in in initiatives are not in our sample. Um, I'm going to explain these programs a little bit better in a bit, uh, but what this graph is showing is that not all of them have legal uh, coverage. Um, regarding the statutory legislations that directly or indirectly refers to social protection, there are three main laws explaining this sector in the countries, this being the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the National Food Security Act, and the ADAR Act, so, uh, uh, and Sorry, in particular, uh, the National Food Security Act has implications in the operation of all food distribution programs, as well as on the criteria adopted by most poverty targeted programs to mediate eligibility. So in our sample, it is the regulatory framework of three out of the four programs with legal coverage. Now going to the next slide. Um, we analyze the adherence of this regulatory framework uh, to the human rights based approach. And what we can see is that overall, uh, the score of this uh, statutory framework is high, with the one exception being the framework of the PMMVY. 
but there is one aspect in which all of them can improve, that is the establishment of an accessible complaints and appeal mechanism. Now, the next slide shows social expenditure. Um, in terms of social expenditure, as the graph is showing, India spends 1% of the GDP on health, 3.8% on education, and 1.5% on social assistance. And going through each sector, uh, the government expenditure in education is lower than the regional average, that is the 4% of the GDP. But um, the country spends considerably more than the regional average on tertiary education and also has the highest enrollment rate for this level. On a positive note, education is the social protection sector receiving the most public funding and government expenditures on education have been slightly increasing since um, 2005. Uh, is, of course, that this doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement. Um, in terms of outcome, India has a high proportion of out-of-school children of lower secondary age, but this figure is highly contested, so we have to be a little bit careful when we're talking about that. For instance, the number presented by UNESCO statistical database shows uh, that 15% or around 11 million children are out of school, while UNDP shows a figure of less than 8%, so there's a big difference there. Now, Going to the health sector, India spends, again, lower than the regional average, spends only 3% of the general government revenue on it, while the regional average is 7%. But then again, the situation is improving as government spending per capita has more than doubled since 2005. However, as a consequence of this low level of government expenditure, out-of-pocket spending represents 65% uh, of of total health expenditure, which has negative impacts as it hampers uh, the access of vulnerable households to healthcare. And so um, it's not surprising that India has one of the highest incidences of catastrophic out-of-pocket health expenditure, meaning that more than 10% of the population spends more than 10% of their income or consumption on healthcare, and 3.9% spends more than 25% of the household's income on that. Um, Consequently, India also has one of the highest impoverishing rates due to these catastrophic expenses, and more than 4% of the population is estimated to have been pushed below the poverty line by out-of-pocket spending on healthcare. Regarding health outcomes, contrary to what these negative figures might lead you to think, they're actually not that far from the regional average, except for underweight prevalence, which is the highest in the region. But then again, the scenario is improving and has been improving since the early uh, 2000s. And the country has coverage indicators such as immunization rates and skilled attendance at birth that are actually above regional average, uh, being above 80%, which is pretty good. Now, finally, when it comes to social assistance, the situation is very different from health and education as India has the highest spending in the region with the highest proportion of its expenditure being directed towards uh, food and in-kind transfers, besides also being the country that allocates more funds to unconditional cash transfers. And uh, there is evidence that the larger share of benefits is indeed directed to poorer families, meaning that the country's social system system is progressive in absolute terms. And besides that, uh, the social assistance has also been found to have significant impacts, um, sorry, <laughs> impacts on inequality in India. So overall, what this picture is showing is that uh, the country has a lot to gain by expanding uh, social protection expenditure, but of course that this requires considerable and stable investments over time. Um, and considering the Indian high debt to GDP ratio uh, that is above 60%, this should also involve higher tax collect collection. And the country is, again, uh, making movements towards this direction, especially after the implementation of goods and services uh, tax in 2017. So again, this shows a positive change. Now the next slide uh, shows the Thank you. General characteristics of the programs that are included in our sample. Um, a quick explanation here. Uh, the E letter that appears on the table refers to eligibility criteria, while the P shows priority, meaning that uh, people don't have to have these characteristics to be included um, within the eligible population for the benefit. 
Now, uh, what overall this table shows is that uh, the national programs, uh, the national flagship programs are quite varied. Uh, they have different types of programs, different uh, target groups, uh, different benefit types. And I'm gonna explain just very briefly the programs that we have included in our sample, so you get to know them a bit. Um, the first one is the targeted public distribution system, which is the largest public distribution program in the world. It's a joint responsibility between central and state governments and distribute food and non-food items at subsidized rate, but there is some variation in the list of items uh, depending on the state. The second one is the Janani Saruksha Yojana that provides poor women with financial incentive for receiving pre and postnatal care and delivering their children in private or public health facilities. Uh, the overall goal is to reduce maternal and neonatal mortality, but uh, the benefit, uh, the value of the benefit varies a bit regarding all the, the location. Um, the third program is the quite known Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme Act that was enacted in 2005 to provide uh, employment for all rural Indians above uh, the age of 18 for at least 100 days or equal cash payments in case there is no employment available. And this program has two main objectives. The first one being to reduce rural poverty through the provision of employment opportunities, especially for semi-skilled or unskilled people. And the second one is to stimulate the creation of public assets um, in rural areas as it is a public works program that involves infrastructure building. Um, the fourth program is a midday meal scheme, which is a conditional school feeding program. Uh, it aims at providing nutritional security for children in poverty and improve school attendance and retention rates as well. And again, even though this program is nationwide, there are variations across districts. So for instance, some of them cover only children in primary education, while also uh, others also include children in upper primary classes as well. Um, the fifth program is the National Health Protection Schemes that provide subsidized healthcare for the poorest individual, benefiting around 130 million people. Uh, we also have the National Social Assistance Program that comprehends five schemes. It's basically, basically a social pension scheme. Um, it provides a minimal national standard for social assistance and uh, it gives unconditional cash and kind transfers for people living below the poverty line, uh, targeting at the elderly, widows, people with disabilities and households without a breadwinner. And lastly, we have the Pradhan Mantri Matritva Vandana Yojana. Uh, that was, it's a recent program. It was introduced in 2017. And is a CCT scheme that provide cash transfers for pregnant and lactating women who are at least 19 year, years old, but for the first birth only. Um, so importantly, one thing that I want to mention is that even though uh, CAS are not explicitly mentioned uh, within the target population of many of these programs, most of them uh, use a mechanism to target for people that uh, is similar, but it's not exactly a proxy means test. And this mechanism recognizes this CAS as uh, automatic, automatically being part of the target population. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this table is showing gender and child sensitivity. Um, with respect to that, India has taken uh, important steps in recent years to uh, provide the necessary support. Um, as I've said, uh, there are currently two cash transfers programs that are focused on maternal and newborn health, namely the PMMBY and the JSY. But uh, beyond them, um, even other national flagship programs uh, also include some mechanism to improve gender sensitivity. So one great example is NREGA, uh, where uh, gender sensitivity provisions include quotas for women's participation, allocation of less physically intense tasks for women, child care facilities, breastfeeding breaks, breastfeeding facilities, among several other instruments that aim at um, enhancing and facilitating women's participation. Um, next slide, please. So here uh, is the table that shows, as Yannick has explained, um, several papers that focus on evaluating these programs. Again, I'm gonna give a very brief explanation on the table. Uh, first, this darker green color means that desirable effects have been found. 
why with the lighter green means that uh, desirable impacts have been found, but only to a subgroup of the target population. This nude color indicates that no statistically significant effects were identified, while uh, the orange color indicates that undesirable effects were found for a subgroup of the population, and the red color means that undesirable effects were found. Um, on a positive note, uh, we can see that uh, the majority of the programs in the sample have uh, been evaluated. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of them because uh, we don't have time for that, but there's one case that I want to highlight that is the negative evaluation of the, the JSY. Um, what was found in this case is that this program had uh, the undesirable effect of positive, uh, positively impacting the fertility rate. So that would be the undesirable effect. And besides that, uh, Paul Jackson et al. also found that um, the program could be inducing a substitution between private, uh, I mean, delivering private institutions for women to deliver in public institutions. So the program would have uh, more of a positive impact on public institutions. Um, and this substitution would uh, account for around a third of the positive impacts of the JSY on public health facilities. Of course, that uh, this negative evaluation doesn't mean that the country, that sorry, the program is not good and should be replaced. Um, there are other evaluations that point to positive impacts as well. But it's something to be aware of when analyzing the design of the program. Um, now, finally, we go to the next slide that covers the social protection responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so just as uh, we've seen so far, the social protection pre-COVID uh, in India encompasses several diverse uh, social protection schemes, which reach different uh, population groups. And the response to COVID was equally varied, um, including both the implementation of new interventions, but also adaptation of these programs, some of these programs at least. Um, so to focus on the ones that we have seen, for instance, the midday meal scheme was adapted so that uh, children would receive their food at home since school uh, were closed. Um, the beneficiaries of the NSAP also uh, received additional benefits so they could advance their pensions, but also they received top up uh, for a while. While the wage paid through the NREGA was raised and the public distribution system was expanded in order to mitigate food insecurity. So again, the responses uh, target different uh, population groups, including uh, the elderly, disabled, students, farmer, uh, among several others. And the actions were varied uh, as well. So they encompass emergency cash and food transfers, uh, subsidies, uh, and so on. But of course, that this is not to say that um, the response was perfect. There was several criticism, especially regarding uh, the treatment to migrant workers. Um, now, lastly, we go to policy recommendations. That's the next slide. Um, so what we could highlight is that uh, India would benefit from improving the legal coverage of programs that currently do not have statutory legal coverage. As we've seen uh, looking at the samples, this is the case of three out of seven programs. And uh, it's important to always uh, improve and make sure that this regulatory coverage is um, following the human rights-based approach. Uh, another thing is that the country could and should improve uh, the quality and the expenditure um, social protection and always, again, trying to ensure that this expenditure is progressive. Besides adopting measures to ensure that um, all states offer at least the same minimal level of protection for the citizens. Now, one thing that would be interesting if the country did, taking advantage of the regional variations that exist across programs, is to identify the best practices. So of course, uh, especially in a country as big as India, there is a lot of regional variation on characteristics. So it makes sense that, that programs are not exactly the same everywhere. But um, through the analysis of this variation, it could be maybe possible to identify what works best or uh, how to improve these programs in other locations. Um, and lastly, um, there are differences and 
adaptations that could be made in the type of program. So for instance, shifting from cash to cash plus interventions uh, that could enhance the results achieved by them. Uh, with that, I finish my presentation. I want to thank you all for the attention and please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them on the Q&A box. And back to Pedro again. Okay. Thank you, Fabiana. Very interesting presentation. Um, as we're gonna, as we're running a bit late, I will skip my comments. I leave it to the concluding remarks, and we'll hand it over directly to Antara and Suman, who will complement your presentation with their insights as operators of social protection in India. Uh, Antara, over to you. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Pedro, and thank you very much, Fabiana, for setting out the uh, scope so nicely. Um, and good evening and good morning to all of you, depending on which time zone you're joining from. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I will just share my screen with you. Um, so uh, Fabiana has done a great job of setting out how do we look at uh, social protection currently, um, uh, how social protection looks across India, both at uh, uh, a pre-COVID uh, situation and in a post-COVID situation. And what we are going to try and do is give more of uh, reflections around how does um, the what does the current situation look like, what have been uh, the results of the uh, rapid assessments that have been done in the last couple of months, and how do we look at this uh, going forward as uh, what could be potential uh, policy measures that could be taken to better support vulnerable populations in India? Uh, to start, the, the one major thing that, that's been um, uh, common across uh, the different um, rapid assessments that have been done, um, both by UNICEF and by other partner organizations, is that poverty has been rising and there has been significant impact on vulnerable populations of the COVID pandemic, both because of the lockdown and the socioeconomic situation of the pandemic itself. And that is really a large cause of concern. Uh, if we can see through the rapid assessments that UNICEF has done that social protection targeting itself is, uh, is quite problematic and delivery of social protection measures, especially of cash transfers, has had a lot of lacuna and uh, requires significant strengthening, uh, which is of course uh, compounded by the fact that India is a federal structure, which means that there are national programs and state programs. So um, the, uh, the measures need to be contextualized accordingly. Uh, one of the main things that we, that we think could be uh, one of the uh, main sort of pathways that we, uh, that we uh, have going forward, is something that Fabian also referenced, we do need to think about more than cash, especially with the um, cash itself being quite problematic. We need to think about how can additional support and especially complementary services come in to actually better support vulnerable populations. This is especially required for populations like uh, migrant groups, which have been significantly affected in the um, COVID pandemic. Uh, we, are, we are aware of uh, quite a few instances where such plus services are already being initiated at the state government level. And um, it would also be helpful for these to be supplemented with, um, with the uh, in-kind transfers of food, which, are also, which is also very required in, uh, in several parts of the country. One of the main things that, uh, that I think um, are, uh, would be very, very crucial going forward is the need for uh, portability of social protection in India. And what do we mean by this? Uh, a lot of social protection programs in India depend on the domicile uh, that, you are, uh, that you have. So the state domicile determines which social protection programs you have access to. And uh, this is actually quite problematic, especially when you are a work migrant worker. And hence, when you travel from a so state to a destination state, you lose social protection coverage. And uh, this is quite problematic and has been seen to be a significant cause of uh, increasing vulnerability during the COVID pandemic with large influx and outflux of migrant populations. Um, one of the main things that we are seeing, uh, which does require a very, very strong um, uh, focus to, to strengthen, is the need for a better disbursement of entitlements. Um, and this is both cash as well as food. And this is going to be very, very critical going forward, um, especially in the uh, current situation of increasing COVID numbers in India. 
um, one of the, uh, unsurprisingly, one of the, uh, unsurprisingly and sadly, one of the very major issues that, that is coming up now is the um, increase in child labor and child marriage because of the COVID pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of writing across uh, national and state levels on why this is happening, and of course, a large part of it is socioeconomic insecurity, uh, which is what is fueling child labor and child marriage. And we do need, hence, socioeconomic measures like social protection to tackle this alongside uh, complementary services and. This is where I think uh, we do need to, um, I, I think that's, that's where the road is in some ways to uh, strengthen social protection for vulnerable populations in India. Uh, this has been actually echoed uh, by a lot of publications recently. So um, whether it's the United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID in children, which actually straightforwardly says that even though children are not the face of the pandemic, they are amongst its biggest victims mostly because they are actually the ones who are bearing the, be uh, the brunt of the socioeconomic impact. And these are um, uh, situations which are going to, the, the impact of this is going to last lifelong. So we do need to have very specific measures which are targeting children and uh, ensuring protection for children. Um, and ILO had come up with a very interesting uh, policy brief on this around protecting children from child labor. And they have specifically mentioned that social protection could be a particularly effective tool to do so. Uh, of course, UNICEF in its own social protection response to COVID has uh, urged scale, scaling up of cash transfer programs to reach children and expansion of family friendly, uh, friendly policies as well as expanding uh, services linked to cash transfers. Um, uh, an interesting article, uh, an interesting policy brief that I would urge all of you to, uh, to have a look at if you haven't already is a joint publication between UNICEF and ODI on uh, universal child benefits, which specifically talks about uh, how universal child benefits could reduce poverty, especially in low-income and middle-income country. And this is, uh, this is really important given the overriding overrepresentation of children in poverty. And this is where, in some ways, I think the, the Indian story needs to uh, move, where we need to think about why a universal child grant is so very, very important. And the research shows us that it helps impact uh, positively children's health in the first thousand days. Uh, it positively impacts both school attendance, transition, as well as retention. Uh, positively impacts the home learning environment, new access to nutrition for children, as well as better uh, outcomes for gender equality. Uh, and in fact, if you see the statistics in the last few months, uh, there has been a rise in uh, universal child benefits in the COVID pandemic situation in the last few months. Um, and this is particularly important for India, especially where targeting is such a huge problem, uh, that if we take a more universal approach to social protection, it will, have, uh, it will be able to cover vulnerable populations much better. Of course, given the fiscal constraints, which my colleague uh, Shomin Bakshi will talk about, uh, we can think about progressive universalization and start from either the poorest districts or start from particularly vulnerable populations, even say, for example, children from zero to three who are a particularly vulnerable age group. This can help us not only target child poverty, but also potentially household poverty, which is becoming an increasingly uh, uh, critical issue in the Indian context in the, uh, during the pandemic situation right now. It will also, of course, help us tackle better uh, exclusion errors that are arising right now in cash transfers uh, reaching vulnerable populations and will also help us strengthen the social contract between the government and its people. Uh, one of the main things that we do need to think about is how would India build a more shock responsive social protection system. And Fabiano also alluded to some of the measures that can be taken. And this is, could be one of the key pillars that we build going forward. It will also help uh, be, a, uh, it will also be a really important pillar for integrated social protection, which is a, a direction that we do need to think about uh, more specifically for India, where uh, there is a multiplicity of social protection programs at the national and state levels. So it will help to bring um, these different pieces together. Uh, with this, I will hand over to Shomin for uh, his reflections on UCB and fiscal space. Shomin? Thank you, Antara. And uh, just to let you know, I do not have any slide. I will throw some light on the 
fiscal issues that contra constrain India to actually go ahead with some of the stuff, some of the measures that Antara just referred to. And standing today, India is in a fiscal situation which actually has been made worse by COVID-19. But even before COVID-19 broke out, the government of India's and the state government's financial situation was in a very serious condition because of some of the reforms that have happened over the last three, four years. I will get to some of those. But as you know that uh, over the last four decades, India has succeeded in reducing the poverty by less than half. But there are studies conducted and there are estimates which shows that the poverty figures which in 2011-12, as estimated by the Planning Commission was around 22%, is expected to go up to the level of around 30% to 40% because of this COVID-19 and subsequent lockdown uh, announced by the government of India, which actually brought the economic activity to a complete standstill. As you are aware that the state governments in India received finances from central government through the share in central taxes, which is the center's divisible pool, the state's own revenue, grants and aid from the... These are the four major sources of the state government as revenue. But the state governments actually have a major responsibility towards financing of some of the social services schemes and social protection schemes. And often in recent years, since the announcement of the 14th Finance Commission's recommendations, I'm sure many of you know what a finance commission in India does. It is mandated to actually um, announce or declare measures to distribute funds from the center's divisible pool to the state governments and to the rural and urban local bodies, the untied funds mainly. And whenever there are crisis periods, then specific sectoral grants are also uh, announced. Various measures are announced for devolution of funds to specific sectors. Some of the recommendations have gone from many agencies to the Finance Commission, to the upcoming Finance Commission, that's the 15th Finance Commission. So what the 14th Finance Commission did in 2014-15 was that it enhanced the state's share in its untired grant from 32% to 42%. But subsequently, it reduced the schemes for specific grants in aid to the state governments as, and the state governments were actually asked to bear the major responsibility of financing some of the central sector schemes where funds are actually divided between the center and the states. Having said that, one can see that for most of the social sector schemes or the social protection program, some of them Fabiana has talked in greater detail, like the Pradhan Mantri Matri Vandana Yojana or ICDS Integrated Children Development Scheme, the, so the Children Protection Scheme, ICPS. The allocation for these schemes from the government of India has either remain stagnant or has marginally increased. Very marginal increase has been there in the allocation between over the last three, four years. So it's a fact that COVID-19 had made things really worse for India, but the measures adopted as a part of the 14th Finance Commission recommendation and the subsequent GST reform, which came into effect in 2018, left the states in a situation where states do not have 
many sources of their own revenue to fund the enhanced responsibilities that they were asked to shoulder for the central sector schemes. As a consequence, when the COVID-19 hit, there was a complete disjoint between the sources of revenue available with the government of India and the state governments and the enhanced responsibilities because of the emergency that's to be met because of COVID-19, in addition to the routine activities which certainly had to be performed by the government of India. And in many cases, it was observed that the routine activities of immunization, routine activities towards nutrition, the midday meal scheme which Fabiana talked about, the school closure which had happened, it has significantly impacted the health and of the women and children. And if you look at specifically PMMVY, which is a program, as Fabiana had mentioned, that the objective is to compensate the wage loss for the woman during pregnancy and immediately after the birth of the child. But if you look at the allocations from the very beginning, of the design of this program that has been made for this program. And if it is compared to the daily wage that a wage earner in a rural area would get, it has remained less than half of the total allocation what has been made to meet the wage compensation or to make up for the loss, loss of wages that a pregnant woman and the lactating mother when delivering for the first time would incur. So if you have a program designed on paper, which is one of the best social security program perhaps designed in Indian context, you may find that. And it has been observed in many of the monitoring exercises that not more than a quarter of the eligible beneficiaries are actually able to access the benefits under the PMMVY simply because of the fact that the process of enrollment to the requirement to the compliance and because the conditions attached to the devolution of these funds are for the beneficiaries to access these funds are so cumbersome that it becomes very difficult to enhance the enrollment under the Pradhan Mantri Matri Vandana Yojana. So when we look at the government of India's finances and the capacity or the ability to actually universalize the, the child grant or for that matter, enhance the coverage of PMMVY as Antara has been recommending from time to time. And we have been advocating with the government of India that it should not be only for the first time mother because the second time mother also undergo wage losses because she won't be able to go for work and won't be able to earn, which otherwise she would earn under say, Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. So, the allocations are not adequate. There is budgetary inadequacy to meet the expenses required under the social protection programs. And as Pedro had mentioned for Pakistan, a similar problem exists in Indian context in terms of the tax buoyancy. And many of you would have seen the estimates that have been coming out and you can see that the, first, the economic contraction, which was estimated to the tune of around 4%, when estimate was done in April 2020, has significantly been increased to 11.5% for FY 2021 by the Moody's and to 9% from 4% by the Asian Development Bank when the estimates came out in June. So you can imagine that what is going to be the situation of various taxes that are at the disposal of the government of India as well as the state governments. One can see that there has been significant reduction in the collection of GST in the months of June, July, and August, when supposedly quite a few of the economic activities had started compared to the GST collection in the same period during the previous year. Even before the COVID-19 broke out, the government of India's devolution in 2019-20 fiscal year to the state governments was 30% lower than what it was forecasted uh, 
during the beginning of the 14th Finance Commission period, that's 2014-15. And the GST reform has actually, or the GST uh, regime has actually constrained the state government's ability to mobilize own resources to meet the enhanced responsibility of social protection or for providing various social services schemes. While expanding social protection benefits to broad section of society has become imperative in the current context, it is becoming more and more difficult for the government of India and the state governments to actually mobilize funds to do the same. Estimates have shown that government of India's fiscal deficit is perhaps going to increase to 7% of GDP compared to 3% what is allowed or what is statutorily allowed through the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. And that is something which is going to be even disastrous if we look at the fiscal deficit of the state governments. The total is going to be an estimated something between 15 and 17 percent. The exact figures are yet to come. There is a need to look for alternative sources of financing. financing social services and social protection schemes beyond the budgetary allocation, innovative models. And there has been advocacy done by various organizations, including UNICEF, speaking to the Ministry of Women and Child Development to create some kind of a fund, some kind of children welfare fund at the national level, which would mobilize resources from partially from the corporate, corporate social responsibility, which is a source of fund beyond the budget for the government, could be from the high net worth individuals and the private participation, and also from voluntary, voluntary contributions from other organizations which have happened. So this alternative innovative mechanism of funding could be thought of beyond the conventional budgetary allocation if India is really interested to universalize the benefits specifically for children benefit, as well as program like Pradhan Mantri Matri Vandana Yojana, which has implication for both pregnant women, as well as for the next generation of children who are going to be born to weak mothers, if not given adequate support during the pregnancy. Notwithstanding the budgetary constraint, government of India had announced a 67-68% increase in the budgetary allocation for 2021 under the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. But again, if you look at this particular allocation increase and the migration problem which has happened very of late during the lockdown, that it has gone against the woman because all returning migrant laborer, those have been enrolled, have significantly been, has remained inclined towards male enrollment. These challenges are going to continue and unconventional modes of financing and also perhaps monetizing the deficit are left with some of the options for government of India, of course, at the risk of reducing or a degraded sovereign rating which may restrict the external borrowing for the country. That's all. I will stop here. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antara and Suman. This was a very interesting presentation touching on a set of different yet complementing aspects of social protection has given a really nice view of what's to come in terms of social protection agendas and as women concluded challenges for India as well. Um, we've got quite a lot of, of questions which is good. Uh, I would like to take this also as an opportunity to invite colleagues to to convey us any any other questions they might have in case we don't have time to answer all those questions. Uh, we will provide written replies, uh, which will be made available on the web page of the event. On that note, one of the questions we received from Saftar was on whether this webinar was being recorded and whether that would be made available afterwards. So the, the answer to both questions is yes, 
connected to via the Ebonges very web page. On the same web page you have registered for the webinar. And now going to the <clears throat> to the actual question, Christopher from Christopher has, has sent us many questions. Uh, basically asking whether there, there are some sort of normative framework or commitment laying out minimum, minimum, minimum values, minimum grounds for committing budget to social areas and more specifically to health, education and social protection. Uh, I, I believe this question was conveyed mostly to Fabiana. So, other questions to Fabiana were on, on portability of social protection. Actually, we had a lot of questions on portability, some to Fabiana, others to also to Antara. People were basically interested to understand more on um, what are the main challenges of, of portability of social protection, what are the possible solutions to those challenges, and more specifically, Beatriz has requested about what is the current state of registries of social protection programs in India, and whether th there is any expect any, any chance of envisioning quick wins in terms of integrating these registries and deploying integrated registries as means to facilitate portability of social protection across the country. Um, as for Yannick, Beatrice has asked him whether she has noticed that the impact evaluation of this has indicated some interest in uh, the program has not returned desirable impact on a few areas. It has mostly uh, brought positive impacts, but in, in some areas it has not returned those positive impacts. But as Yannick ha has taught us that B the BIS BISP program is, is undergoing a lot of modifications, Beatriz has asked whether those design modifications have the potentiality to, to generate those impacts which were not identified for the previous format of the program. Mm. I guess I will leave you with these questions for the time being. And in the meanwhile, I will wrap up a second set of questions to be placed to the presenters afterwards. Uh, Yannick, uh, would you mind starting answering that? Absolutely, my pleasure. And I'm going to keep my turn off not to compromise bandwidth any fur further this time. Beatriz, the question, it's an excellent question. Um, so, uh, I mentioned um, for the BISP impact evaluation was a rather subdued impact domain. And the thing, uh, like a recurrent theme, if we look at other impact evaluations in South Asia, um, is that a lot of time is determined by um, two factors. One is so supply side constraints um, and the other one is um, with the benefits actually paid and here especially the amount of benefits paid um, while I can't speak for the um, for the supply side in in Pakistan since that is a different issue from um, amending program design of the BISP um, what I can for Esas Kafala, which is the um, successor program, which was your question, that um, transfers are being moved from um, quarterly payments um, all the way to monthly payments. So um, transfer regularity has increased and also transfer amount has increased. So formerly there was a transfer of, um, I think, 5,000 Pakistani rupees, if my mind serve me, serves me right, per quarter. Um, and this amount is now um, 2,000 Pakistani rupees per month. Um, so these two issues have been addressed. Um, and then on top of that, the new SS Kafala transfer makes a number of um, amendments, such as um, providing biometric payments, um, endowing all um, 
female beneficiaries with bank accounts. So um, making um, important headway in, in the realms of um, financial inclusion. Um, and another very important addition uh, does not just have to do with the new program, but generally um, an update on how the social registry um, draws its data um, because formally it, it based on the poverty scorecard survey that was conducted in 2010 so um, quite a few years ago um, and it did not have formal mechanisms for updating and now for the first time currently there's um, an, a, a thorough updating is being conducted um, and there are measures being put in place for desk-based updating and desk-based enrollment, so flexibilizing these enrollment conditions. Um, and my, yeah, my, my hope would be and my trust would be that these additions will make important, um, important progress toward making um, the BISP or the unconditional cash transfer in Pakistan, however you might want to call it, um, making it even more effective. Um, I think the second question, if I see it immediately from, from Beatriz, um, was, was connected to health spending. So if I may, I'm going to briefly answer, answer that one in conjunction. And here she said, okay, so um, you talked about like low health spending and then a link to poor health outcomes. Um, and I want to, first of all, provide um, a disclaimer here that, of course, our studies are comparative studies. So what we're doing here is we're um, comparing different countries at a regional scope and we're not, um, we can't, we oftentimes can't claim causality here um, in this kind of study that we're um, conducting. What we can say, though, is um, that we see that much of the health expenditure in, um, in Pakistan, which is low to start with, is being borne by, by households through out-of-pocket spending. And as a matter of fact, two thirds of this is borne by um, out-of-pocket spending. So if you have this burden of health spending lying with private households, this of course discourages in in preventive health measures such as immunization, such as in, uh, maternal care. Um, so here is where the state really needs to, to, to do more, which is um, thankfully, I think, uh, come to their attention um, and, and reflect it in the new budget. Um, and here also there is a need to come in with social protection, for example, for pregnant and lactating women. Um, so uh, yeah, these are uh, many of these things. Thankfully, are on the menu and are on the agenda of the Pakistani government, which uh, yeah makes me optimistic that we will see improvements in these indicators and in the social protection system uh, of Pakistan in the not far fu uh, future. Thank you, Yannick. Uh, Fabiana, would you? Would you mind then addressing those questions that were conveyed to you? Um, no, of course, thank you. Thank you all for the questions. Um, first, uh, the one regarding a minimal level of expenditure and social protection. Of course, that uh, there are recommendations and there are um, declarations on the topics that were asked, specifically health. Um, so countries like, including India, have uh, signed some declarations that establish some commitments. Uh, I know of one called Astana Declaration that establishes commitment regarding primary health care. Um, and in, India has endorsed that declaration. But um, as far as I'm aware, the, it, there isn't any specific level of health expenditure that is established. So there isn't any commitment in that sense. And one thing that uh, should be taken into consideration is that there isn't um, a one-size-fits-all answer to this type of issue because uh, the type of programs and how much you should spend on them, it's going to depend on the characteristics of the, your population and on the risks that your population faces. So to give a very uh, basic example, for instance, if you're looking at one country that has a very young population, you might want to focus more and spend more on education, while a country that has an aging population, so has a greater number of 
of uh, older people might need to focus more on pensions. So um, there isn't really any number that must be followed by every country. Um, now, regarding the other question that was on social protection for stability, uh, this is actually one of the biggest issues in regarding the social protection system in India, and it is uh, it affects and particularly migrant workers. And um, a significant share of the Indian population is composed of internal migrants, so this isn't um, a negligible part of the population, but yet um, portability is quite limited. So this means that many of these migrant workers, the majority of them, once they migrate, they lose access to many of the benefits that they had in their original state. Um, and you have to also consider that many of these migrant workers are one, informal workers, so their access to social insurance benefits is also limited. Um, but two, they often live and work in um, poorer conditions, so they, they are part of the vulnerable population, so um, they face risks that could be mitigated through social protection and yet they don't have this access. Um, so this is one of the greatest issues, but there are some countries that are at least planning um, to increase the mobility of social protection, uh, specifically mobile ration cards. I think they are um, Andhra Pradesh. I don't know how to <laughs> correctly say all of them, but Mahashtra and Rajasthan. Um, so it is a, a step into the correct direction, I think, but definitely this is something that um, still needs a lot of improving. Okay, thank you, Fabiana, very much. And Antara, uh, on a related to that, you, you've received questions about the state of the registries in the country and whether integration of registries could present a, a quick solution to the, the subject of social protection portability. Do you wanna uh, share some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and actually, I think that the question and something that we've been also um, working on as UNICEF, um, currently, we don't have a consolidated single registry system in India, unlike a lot of other countries. So we do not have a, a, a one registry from which different vulnerabilities can be filtered out and social protection programs can be um, assigned and targeted accordingly. We don't have that kind of a system. We have programmatic registries. And um, it is really important to build this kind of integration. There are, however, challenges because uh, in some of the registries that we have uh, tried to investigate a little bit more deeply to understand the potential for integration. Um, we have seen that some of these registries are, are maintained on paper. So even uh, they're not uh, they are not online or they're not um, uh, available uh, in a way that integration is very easily possible. Um, and I think that uh, in, in the long run, that type of a social registry will help to ensure that vulnerable populations are not left out. But we need to be really careful when people are enrolled into um, such a registry. We have something in India called the uh, Socioeconomic Caste Census, which was undertaken roughly around now a decade ago, um, which does actually list out vulnerable uh, populations based on certain specific criteria. But that's uh, in, in many ways about as close as we have come to that. Some states like Madhya Pradesh have what is called the Samagra um, uh, portal, which actually is uh, a single registry, but only for that state and only for specific programs. Um, so we do have quite a long way to go in this, but it is absolutely critical and, we, and really, um, I think we're finding it even more critical in the current COVID situation where it would be really important to identify and support vulnerable populations. I hope that answers your question, Beatrice. Thank you, Antara. That was a very good uh, answer. So if you could squish a few more questions before uh, we conclude this webinar. And there was a very interesting and provoking question to Suman by Beatrice. She asked, how do you, and 
She asked, how do you interpret the fact that the Pradhamantra Yojana is the program of, of the sample considered by the IPC with least adherence to the human rights based approach uh, framework? Uh, do you see any relation between that and the, the more fiscal uh, specificities that you brought about this program? Uh, also, another interesting question uh, to Suman came from Richard. Uh, I believe he's speaking from Ghana, and he has asked whether the population is preparing to support the current government to face the challenges that Suman has, has presented to us, more trying to gauge whether you know, the population is adhering to the universal protocols, whether civil society organization are have been supportive of the government. And he has also put, asked what kind of help from third countries could, could come in place for India at this point. And finally, um, um, Beatriz has also asked Yannick to, to, to share some more, more thoughts on, on linkages between Pakistan health expenditure and the expanded expenditure and its health outcomes. Uh, I believe in that part, your audio has, has cut a little bit, so if you could have another two cents on that, it would be great. But let's start by Suman. Over to you, Suman. Hi there, Suman. Uh, thank you, Beatriz, for your question. Yes, as uh, Pedro says, very provoking one. I do not know whether I should be commenting on PMMVY from the compliance to human rights issues or dimension. But certainly one thing which comes to my mind is, if you look at the programs funded by Government of India, there are overlapping um, beneficiary coverage or beneficiaries that are being targeted through various program. And there is PMMVY, there is Janani Suraksha Yojana, there is Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao. And similar to PMMVY program, the Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao provides similar benefits for girl child immediately after the birth. So government of India has tried to rationalize quite a few of the schemes actually that are being funded rather than thinly spreading funds across the various programs which may have overlapping targeting targeted beneficiaries perhaps a better rationalized approach of converging some of the social protection programs would actually help india to create the required fiscal space that's one part of the story and uh, of course I would uh, reiterate what I said last time is that the conditions that are attached itself are some of the actually should be some of the objectives of PMMVY that's to be achieved, but they have been attached at conditions and as a result, it becomes very difficult for the beneficiaries to access those benefits. And there are initiatives which are being adopted by uh, UNICEF towards actually building the capacity at the local level and also awareness and also helping them with the uh, to achieve the or to adhere to the required uh, compliance etc so that's something which uh, should be noted here in this context and on the universalization approach thank you richard and uh, how people of india are actually preparing see uh, in addition to the challenges even within the management, managing the government finances and the fiscal uh, side of it, uh, the government of India has got quite a bit of fund from the donors. Actually, there has been substantial uh, announcement from the World Bank, from the Asian Development Bank. There are discussions with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and also there has been some discussion on economic restructuring bit with the IMF. I do not know about the IMF latest status of that discussion, 
but as you say that the funds are flowing from abroad or from the donors particularly asian development bank and the world bank have allocated specific funds for the social protection and um, last objective should be universalization and that is where unicef is expected to play a major role and we have been with the government of india to advocate for universalization particularly child benefit and also the pmmvy which currently is restricted to the first time birth only and as i said that beyond the budgetary resources is a possibility and at some point of time perhaps government to have to look at beyond budgetary resources and bringing in private partners and uh, corporates to actually contribute uh, to this cause i will stop here thank you okay thank you suman uh, thank you colleagues uh, i believe we have asked most questions i've noted uh, the other question for yannick had already been replied on on health so i would like to quickly open it here for the presenters to to deliver any concluding remarks if they deem needed otherwise we should be wrapping up the session for today uh, yannick any concluding remark you would like to make? No, I think I've been, uh, I've, I've um, provided my comprehensive opinion. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and of course, if participants um, might have any questions uh, after the webinar, uh, we're of course happy to, to still answer them. So maybe just uh, my concluding appeal, check out the IPCIG website, check out the links uh, for the papers that we presented on today, because they contain much more information that we could fit in, uh, that we could ever fit in to a short webinar like this. So do check them out. They're a great, a great um, repository of information for policymakers and researchers alike. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Yannick. Uh, Fabiana, any concluding remarks from your end? I would just like to thank everyone, uh, everyone that attended the webinar and also repeat Yannick's saying that if anyone has any question, please uh, feel free to ask them and we're going to do our best to reply for, uh, to all of them as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. Antara, any concluding remarks you had? Uh, just uh, a big thank you to everybody uh, for joining us and uh, it's been like a pretty consistent turnout all through. So I'm glad that you found it interesting and um, uh, thank you very much for IPC for, and socialprotection.org uh, for organizing this. Thank you, Antara. Uh, Suman, any last words? Thanks uh, to the audience here and special thanks to Karin and Pedro and Marina for uh, organizing this and giving us the opportunity to present our views on this forum. Thank you very much, Pedro and Karin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, the audience, for joining us, for engaging with very interesting questions. Thank you, the presenters, for the time and the dedication. And I would like to once again invite you to join us on our global e conference that's going to take place on the 5th, 6th, and 8th of October 2012, 2020. And stay tuned for the forthcoming papers on this series of collaborations between the IPC and UNICEF program. Have a good day and a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>